21st century activism. This panel is going to examine shifts in the legal landscape, modern technology, and the understanding of more subtle manifestations of discrimination, uh, of discriminatory impact, advocacy, and activism. The panel moderator for this final session is Daniel Keel, who is an associate professor of law at the University of Memphis Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. Professor Keel teaches constitutional law as well as courses in his research area, race and education. He's, he, he is also director of the Memphis 13, a documentary sharing the stories of the first graders who desegregated Memphis schools. And he's also the 2013 University of Memphis Martin Luther King Award, Human Rights Award winner. Professor Keel will provide uh, further introductions of our panelists, but just to identify them at the start, to my immediate left is, is Cornell Brooks, former president of the NAACP. Next to him is Charles McKinney, a professor at Rhodes College. Uh, next to him is Beverly Tatum, president America, emerita of Spelman College. Uh, on her left, Claude Steele, professor of psychology at Stanford University. And finally, uh, Daniel Keel of the University of Memphis at the far end. So I'll leave it to, to Professor Keel to uh, present the panel. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, what a day that we have to close here. Um, just taking in so much information over the course of the day. And so thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the sponsors. Uh, it's, it's great to be here on this final panel. Activism in the 21st century. Um, before I do the introduction, I just want to share a little bit about um, what I hope the goals for this panel are. Um, we have heard a lot about specific policy areas, whether it be criminal justice or voting rights or uh, health and education reform, uh, tax reform, um, which all are central to Dr. King's work. But if we are theming this day as where do we go from here, I think we have to focus on converting sort of that knowledge to action. And certainly activism uh, and action was at the core of Dr. King's experience as well. And so I thought it would uh, be important and interesting to uh, close the day with a sort of more interdisciplinary group that's uh, considering both what has changed about how we experience or understand racism in 2018 versus uh, in uh, the sort of main portion, heroic portion of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Um, and also what has changed about the strategies and tools that activists have in 2018 to confront that uh, updated and, and, and different, perhaps, understanding of racism. Throughout the day, we've talked about uh, explicit racism and implicit bias as well. Uh, and, I, and I expect that, we'll, that those topics will come up again. I'd also um, like to note that Dr. King was present here in Memphis. Um, not because necessarily of activism that he began, but rather because of a strike that began uh, by sanitation workers uh, here in this city, totally unconnected to uh, Dr. King, although clearly inspired by his work. And so I think uh, the lesson that I draw from that sort of connection is um, about the importance of activists, in addition to leaders, activists being able to draw in leaders in a way uh, that was part of the story here in Memphis during 1968. So uh, to introduce our panel, I'll start to my immediate right. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Claude Steele, who is an author, social psychologist, and campus leader, uh, currently a professor of psychology at Stanford. Uh, his work specializes in the psychology of self-image and self-affirmation, specifically stereotype threat, which I expect he'll uh, expand upon a little, um, but has a lot to do with the effect of racism and the other isms have on individuals' self-identity. So when we spoke in the last panel about the stresses of uh, racism, I think stereotype threat is, is uh, part of that work. Uh, to his right is Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, award-winning author, scholar, psychologist, campus leader, uh, all of these things. She is the president emerita of Spelman College. Uh, and a clinical psychologist with, with a specialization in racial identity development and the impact of race in classrooms. Uh, she's the author of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race, which has recently been updated. And to her right is uh, Dr. Charles McKinney, 
historian, author, and I think increasingly a community leader here in Memphis, uh, chair of Africana Studies and associate professor of history at Rhodes College. Uh, his specialization is in the civil rights movement history, including the creation of institutions for social change in poor and working class communities. Um, he is also someone who has walked in the footsteps of Dr. King uh, with an undergraduate degree from Morehouse College. Uh, and as I mentioned before, has become somewhat of a sage within the growing community of activists here in Memphis. To his right, uh, Reverend Cornell Brooks, a lawyer, activist, spiritual leader, thought leader, uh, among his other activities, past president of the NAACP, and spent time as a trial lawyer as well, so I'm not the only lawyer up here, uh, with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. Uh, like Dr. McKinney, Cornell uh, followed in the footsteps of Dr. King with a graduate degree in theology from Boston University where he is uh, currently a visiting faculty member as well. On a personal note, uh, Reverend, um, Reverend Brooks closed out my second night of Passover Seder with a really rousing uh, call to action and I hope that uh, he'll be able to share that same passion with us this afternoon. So I'll begin um, with the, those expert in psychology on our panel um, and I would invite all, all of you to sort of speak whenever, whenever, whenever you want to speak. I want this to be a uh, conversation in, in, the, in the truest sense. Um, but the question that I'd like to begin with is, um, in what ways has our understanding of racism, its effects, the way that it is understood, the way that it is practiced, the way that it is experienced, changed um, in recent years, whether from a psychological standpoint or a social science standpoint? Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I think it's an interesting question because I think if you date, go back to 1968 when Martin Luther King died, uh, there have been changes in how we think about the nature of racism and prejudice, uh, and they are, they're in, and have interesting implications for activism, where it should focus itself, what, what forms it should take, what we need from it in, in this era. So I'll try to really quickly uh, say what, give a little history, I think, of what the, the, the changes are. I think at that, in that period of time, the dominant view was that uh, our problems, racial inequality, came from prejudice, prejudice minds and hearts of, of individuals. Uh, and that a, a, a chief part of any progressive strategy should be uh, the reduction of prejudice of that sort, and that if we did that, we would see society make considerable progress in reducing in inequality. Um, I, I think over the years since that time, uh, and I'm speaking here a bit ironically as a psychologist, because you'd think psychology, I'd try to claim as much turf as I could claim, but I, I want to decenter the idea of individual prejudice and racism as uh, a bit. This is not to knock it off the stage, but it's to, to decenter it. Uh, and I, I think what has come to light uh, in various social science communities over this period of time is just the overpowering uh, nature of uh, Systems, I, I wish I could find a better word for this, an easier word for this, but white supremacy that date back 500 years and that transmogrify and change over time, but nonetheless uh, have this impact of maintaining racial uh, uh, inequality. It's a bit like bi viruses being able to, without a lot of conscious direction, adapt to uh, antibiotics in a way as to survive. I just offer that as a, as a metaphor uh, for what we're dealing with. Uh, the more you know about history, which I think we've, we've learned a great deal about in that near term, the more you, you see this, this process. Uh, it is so that at this point in time, there are so many components of that system, many of which have been referred to today, that a person uh, doesn't really need to be very prejudiced or biased to implement the system which sustains the the inequality. I'll just give you just a summary of things I, I wrote that, well, while listening today. Uh, dr drug laws and campaigns against uh, drug laws and incarceration practices, bail bonds practices, real estate practices from redlining to, to uh, predatory lending, patterns of school funding and, fu 
and, and uh, excuse me, uh, and financing. Uh, teacher assignments, who gets the quality teachers? Uh, I, I have a pet concern about the use of standardized testing, in particular certain standardized uh, uh, tests. These things sustain uh, racial inequality uh, without a person uh, being part of them, having to uh, themselves have very prejudicial uh, beliefs uh, even. They enable a kind of opportunity hoarding on the part of the already empowered that, uh, uh, and they make that, that action easier. And uh, I don't know, after all these years and being, having been in so many, uh, I'm referring to my age with that comment, uh, having been in so many circumstances, I, I see that, just the enabled opportunity hoarding, uh, and I know that too is a harsh term, uh, being one of the prime drivers of racial inequality. And so uh, what that would say for the focus of, of uh, activism uh, is to not take our eyes off the ball. These structural realities which are part of this system and that have been so enumerated uh, here today are, are critically important foci of any uh, continued uh, activism. Another thing I would say from psychology is that we've learned that attitudes uh, uh, follow behavior more than they proceed it or drive it that often the attitudes we have and recognize in ourselves are, are built up as ways of rationalizing what we've done or rationalizing the current order of things. Uh, and so if you don't dismantle the structures that produce those things, uh, and, and if you could wave a, wedge, a magic wand and wipe out all of the prejudice in people's minds and hearts in one instant, and you left all those structures in place, those uh, prejudices would be regenerated and probably by that, by that afternoon. So uh, I, I don't want us to get you know, off, the, uh, off the beam of uh, dealing with, of, of holding each other so accountable to, to prejudice. It, it's the structures uh, that, that matter. And if you want a big daddy of all the structures, in my estimation, I, I think it's segregation. Uh, segregation has been the chief instrument of this system uh, of, of, of privilege for uh, all of our time on this, on this continent. Uh, all right, having said that, and I'll, I'll, I'll ho hopefully be really snappy with this, having said that, I, I do think there's another kind of challenge that has also been brought to light by social science research in this uh, era, which I might call it the cost of integration. Uh, if you go back to 68, we may have all been a little bit naive about what it would really take to bring our peoples together in our institutional settings like our, our corporations, our schools, our neighborhoods. Uh, we're bringing people together with very different histories, very different frameworks, and very different vulnerabilities in these diverse uh, settings. And I think we're really just beginning to understand some of the challenges there. I would say uh, stereotype threat is a good example of the kind of pressure that comes with integration. It's simply being in a situation or doing something that's important to you for which you know you could be judged or treated in terms of a negative stereotype about your group. So when you create an integrated uh, situation, uh, let's say it's a workplace, that can be an ongoing pressure uh, in the life of, of all the people in, in, that, in that setting. There are different forms of stereotype uh, threat. You can have, th there are stereotypes about abilities which may affect minorities. There are stereotypes about racism which may affect uh, the dominant group. The apprehension about being seen in terms of these kinds of stereotypes is a, creates a stress, a pressure in integrated situations which uh, I think we're just beginning to understand and, uh, and, and accept as something that is a part of successfully integrating a society in the sense that Martin Luther King had in mind. Uh, I'll end with this uh, notion from him. Uh, I've, I've looked at these impacts in particularly on, on uh, school performance and uh, higher education, but, all, but throughout uh, schooling, the impact of stereotype threat on uh, test performance, on, on uh, persistence in, uh, at, at school, on the kind of major that a person uh, uh, chooses. Um, and uh, one of the, I suppose, the most fruitful directions of remedy for this kind of pressure are people that can convey uh, a, 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 can build a trust with students. Uh, that is something that is in a diverse setting a commodity. 
trust. It's hard to do that when we've had the history together that we've had. And that trust visits us in our daily lives and affects our performance and functioning in the settings of our lives that are most important to us. And the capacity to, to, to build that trust is something that I think we're going to have to get much more sophisticated about. I hope that our, our activism gets, gets to the point where teacher training, executive training, people, Amer as Americans, we begin to understand the extra work that is going to be needed in order to make these kinds of uh, settings uh, effective. King, in, uh, toward the end of his life, uh, uh, had a very famous quote. I'm not going to remember it uh, exactly, but one of the anxieties he had about integrated schooling was that our children won't be educated by people who love them. That's a very that, that turns out to be a very prescient concern, yeah. uh, as he was so prescient about so many things. Uh, that turns out to be a very profound concern. If I could add to what uh, Claude has already said, I think one of the most significant changes since 1967, you know, beyond the psychological research that was just talked about, is the demographic change. Mm -hmm. And I want to say something about that because um, I was born in 1954. In, ni in the 1950s, the U.S. population was 90% white. Just think about that for a minute, 90% white. In 2014, the school age population was more than 50% kids of color. That's a big change. And that demographic change has, I think, um, brought some of these questions, particularly this notion of white supremacy, uh, to the fore in a way that we are now all experiencing. In particular, if you just think about the way the populations change. Latinx is our, the largest population of color, approximately 18% of the population today. African Americans, 13%. Asian Americans are 6%, and that particular population is the fastest growing population in the U.S. Um, in 1967, only 1% of babies were classified as multiracial. Today, 10% are. So we see this population rapidly changing, and you hear more and more the articulation of white fear about being outnumbered um, and what that might mean. Um, we know that that's a source of anxiety, and even the election of a black president in 2008, I think, challenges this idea of white supremacy. I read an article recently by Michelle Norris in the April edition of National Geographic, and she said, most people have never had a black boss, and now they have a then they had a black president, <laughs> you know? Um, that, that sense of the world being turned on its head uh, at some visceral level is, I think, part of what we see in terms of how, I'm a clinical psychologist, how people respond to cognitive dissonance and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so I think we certainly see that manifesting itself in the response to the Trump election. But I think even as we talk about um, the as I like to say, new faces, the demographic shift, we have the same places. I like the phrase you used, Claude, opportunity hoarding, that new faces but same places. Our schools are as segregated today as they were 30 years ago, in some places more so, and neighborhoods are as segregated. Those patterns of racial segregation that were put into place now centuries ago persist. And so what I think about when we think about where do we go from here is a quote that Dr. King uh, wrote in that book, Where Do We Go From Here? I'm just going to read it. He wrote, like life, racial understanding is not something that we find, but something that we must create. What we find when we enter these mortal planes is existence. But existence is the raw material out of which all life must be created. A productive and happy life is not something that you find, it is something that you make. And so the ability of racial groups to work together to understand each other will not be found ready-made. It must be created by the fact of contact. You were talking, Claude, about how awkward that can be in those places where there is integration, or at least, if we don't want to use the word integration, at least some racial contact. Um, certainly in the United States today, the places where you are most likely to experience racial contact is either in the military 
or in colleges and universities. Because as uh, homogeneous as some colleges and universities are, they tend to be more diverse than the places the students came from. And so when we think about uh, students coming into colleges and universities engaging with one another across lines of difference, it's not a surprise that they are not able to do so very easily because of the stereotype threat about being perceived as racist on the part of white students or the microaggressions that occur uh, that uh, students of color experience when they're engaging with people who um, are breathing in the smog of stereotypes as they've grown up. Mm -hmm. So when the question of what should 21st century activism look like, to me, I think of dialogue as 21st century activism because it is the lack of empathy that, um, that allows these conditions to persist. If you think about what moves somebody to take action, to speak up about a policy, to march in the streets, sometimes people are driven by a sense of what's right, a sense of moral compass, but more often it's because somebody they care about is being affected. And it's not until people have enough contact with each other to care about one another that we will, I think, see the kind of dismantling of structural systems that we all want to see. It just as we ex expand the lens here, not only how has racism and our understanding of it changed since 1968, but um, going on to the further down the panel, um, what about our understanding of activism? How, how is activism different today? You know, whether it's tools of activism or modes of activism, um, what's different about trying to create change in 2018 uh, than trying to create change in 1968? Okay. Um, so uh, this is a rough, a rough spot to be sitting here um, with uh, two of my academic, uh, two of my academic uh, idols. Um, it's overwhelming. Um, activism today, I think one of the things that's really important for us to focus on is the fact that um, activism today is going to look different in some ways. Um, social media, I think the structure of leadership in terms of who is being called, who, um, who, is, uh, who has the space to create, to craft new organizations. We see this playing out with the organization Black Lives Matter, um, founded by three queer women, right? So we're gonna see shifts in, in, shifts in structure, shifts in leadership, shifts in communication because of the realities of social media. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that these shifts, um, the question on the table is how do these new innovations um, help us to confront old problems, right? Um, poverty ain't new, right? It didn't swoop in um, on the heels of Trump's election, right? Um, Memphis has been battling with poverty for a really long time. And everybody in the room who's from Memphis knows this. This is not a surprise to anybody. Um, and so the reasons that people are going to be drawn to activism um, whether it's around poverty or whether it's around mass incarceration, whether it's around the murder of unarmed black people, men, women, and children, Tamir Rice, 14 years old. 12. Uh, 12, excuse me. Yeah. Um, those reasons are um, rooted in right, the patterns and practices of, of racism in the United States. Right? Tamir Rice can happen because we live in a highly racialized society so that a 12-year-old boy can be seen as a threat. Right? That's ancient. Um, we can go back to, the, I'm the historian, right? So we can go back to the slave codes. We can go back to instances where um, white fear, right, um, literally sh uh, shapes and crafts legislation, right? It crafts the legal infrastructure. It crafts political infrastructure. It crafts economic infrastructure, right? So I say all of that to say that the challenges that are driving people out into the streets are not new. The other thing that I would add in terms, of, uh, in terms of activism today is activists now are much better at sort of facing the challenge related to um, getting their analysis out, right, in terms of why they are out in the streets, right? Um, that takes a little while in 1960, 
right? It takes a little while for folks to figure, figure out why four black students from North Carolina A&T University, go Aggies, um, right, are, are sitting in, in on February 1, 1960. That news takes a little while to reverberate. So information is vital here. It does, right, the social media of the day, networks, fraternities, sororities, um, you know, athletic networks, um, religious networks, social networks, cultural networks, that information disseminates and so then people are able to buy into and invest in this movement, right? Hey, this is a great idea. You see what happened in Greensboro? I think we should do that here at Fisk. I think we should do that down here at Spelman and Morehouse. I think that we should do this all, all over the place, right? And so, um, so the instantaneous nature of, of that analysis, right, um, is an opportunity for us to bring more people in to um, bring more people into the arena, right, and provide people the information as to why activists are engaged in what they're doing, which also gives us the opportunity then to, in many instances, understand the, in most instances, not all, but in most instances, the well-crafted analysis that activists are bringing to the table in terms of why they go out into the streets, right? Um, King is called a, a, a hothead and race agitator when he takes to the streets in 1955, 1961, 1963, 1966, 1968, right? The man's got a PhD in systematic theology. The man's um, trained at Morehouse College. His, 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 uh, his, one of his mentors is Benjamin Mays, right? One of the titans, one of the absolute titans of the early civil rights movement. If you don't know who Benjamin Mays is, look him up, Google him, right? Dr. King, is labeled a, a hot-headed activist. Despite the fact that almost everything he writes shows a brilliant understanding and analysis, not only of American history, but also of America's racial history. A brilliant analysis of the intractability of American racism, right? We see those types of analyses being produced by activists today, right? Um, the sisters who create Black Lives Matter have an analysis. The brothers and sisters who create Dream Defenders down in Florida that was protesting for gun control, right, way before, you know, the most recent, right, way before the most recent uh, uh, atrocity. But they were black kids, so you didn't hear about them, right? Um, you know, the, all, of these, all of these moments of opportunity and analysis that are being crafted, that are being constructed, um, by activists. Now we've got an opportunity to directly confront them, right, and to see, okay, you know, to kick the tires a little bit, right? But the thing that happens, right, that's so similar to other, to other moments, and this will be my, my last point, is the realization of the intractability, right? The realization of the intractability. There are, um, there are reasons that we are stuck here, and one of those reasons is the opportunity hoarding, but also, I would say, the investment. Right? We know what causes poverty, but there are some certain things that we just don't want to do in order to alleviate that poverty. If you want to pull people out of poverty, stop paying them slave wages. That's how that works. Right? So, so what we'll see then, so what we'll see then is activists taking, um, uh, taking a course of action that looks familiar to, to many of us, right? And again, this is the king in action in terms of, hey, you know what? He lays it out in a letter to a Birmingham jail. First, we have negotiations. Hey, Birmingham, would you stop being racist and segregationist? Birmingham says, no, no thank you, no we're not. Okay, now it's time to protest, right? You didn't hear us the first time around. You didn't hear, we weren't speaking in a language that you could understand. That's what protest is, right? You didn't understand when we sat down across the table and said, hey, let's stop this white supremacist practice of segregation. You said no. You didn't hear us, so let's find another way for you to hear us. People out in the streets is a way for you to hear us. And then after you've heard us, then maybe we can come back and have another round of negotiations. Because now you see and understand that if this doesn't go well, then we ain't shopping on uh, Easter weekend. right? If this doesn't go well, we're not going to be on the buses for the next 387 days. If this doesn't go well, as Martin King says in March, he says, you're organized enough here, you're, you're, you're unified enough here in Memphis, if you don't get what you want, this is the King you didn't hear about in the coloring books, right? If you don't get what you want, you should have black folk, you, need, you should have a general strike in Memphis. Shut it down. 
not just sanitation workers. He was like, if you're black and live in Memphis, don't go to work. Right? So again, what activists bring to the table is an analysis of the situations in which they find themselves. And that analysis, in most instances, again, not all, but in most instances, is deeply rooted and embedded in a longer and broader historical analysis because so many of these problems may have new faces, may have new wrinkles, may have new perspectives or new angles, but they ain't new. So if it ain't new, I guess I'm left to say what's old. So being here in Memphis, we are painfully and poignantly mindful of the fact that to have a discussion about 21st century activism, we have to appreciate that what has brought us here was the fact that the apostle of nonviolence came to Memphis and himself became a victim of gun violence. And that occurrence 50 years ago has more resonance for today. So when we think about the fact that on March 29th, 1968, we have a march in which 280 people are arrested, 60 people are injured, a 16-year-old is killed in the wake of two sanitation workers who were crushed to death sitting on the back of a truck trying to escape the rain. That's a narrative that's not merely a civil rights story at the end of which is an act of violence, but rather a civil rights saga in which violence is at the beginning, the middle, and the end. In other words, the sanitation, work, sanitation workers were subject to occupational violence. The fact of the matter is in 2018, Solid waste workers or sanitation workers today have jobs that are more dangerous than firefighters and police officers today. Here in Memphis today, sanitation workers in a southern city work in trucks where the air conditioning has been taken out today. And so we see this relationship between state sanctioned and state ignored violence and economic injustice which should sound familiar to us because when we think about what happened in Ferguson when Michael Brown lost his life or his life was in fact taken, mm. there was an unholy relationship between predatory policing and predatory taxation. In other words, state sanctioned violence and economic injustice. And so when we to have a discussion about what's different about 21st century activism, we have to appreciate the fact that the relationship between state sanctioned, state ignored violence and economic injustice is more subtle. So in other words, as Professor Still lifted up, we have these collateral sanctions that keep people from working who have criminal records. We have police officers who are driven by implicit bias and codes of irresponsibility and lack of accountability allow 950 to 1,000 people to lose their lives at the hands of the police every year, with a young black man being 21 times more likely to lose his life at the hands of the police than his white counterpart. And so that relationship between the economic injustice and violence continues. Now, there are a couple of points of distinction in terms of how things are different. I agree with my colleagues that because of the technology, uh, things are infinitely different. What I mean by that is Joanne Robinson could produce 52,500 leaflets mm -hmm. uh, on the eve of the Montgomery boycott to get the word out. Today, we have millions of tweets regarding police misconduct. And so the digital reach is wider, but not always as deep. In terms of engaging and having sustained relationships and bringing people together so that we organize sustainably for the long haul, long haul in a multi-generational way. In other words, having the Facebook crowd and the Instagram crowd together, critically important. Because you can't have the old schoolers outsourcing the revolution to the new schools. It doesn't work that way. People are being killed uh, and, and brutalized alike. Second point, I think, of, of distinction here is the same need for hope. So when we think about the fact that Dr. King was trained in a form of moral philosophy at Boston University, 
are called Boston personalism, which is predicated on the notion of the Imago Dei, namely that every person is created in the image of God, and as a consequence, they have innate worth. Well, translated and transliterated into modern day terminology, black lives matter. It, we have a theological point updated, sociologically speaking. You have a, a black, black, black Baptist preacher lifting up uh, German philosophy, uh, European philosophy, but spoken through the mouths and through the, through, through, through the, through, through the lips and bodies of a generation of, of young activists all across the country. It's essentially the same message. And so theologically speaking, we today are saying what was said a generation ago, but we have to say it in a way that gives people hope. You know, Dr. King talked about the fact that we have to accept disappointment, we have to accept finite disappointment, but we can't give up infinite hope. Organizing today is in much the same way as it was years ago. You have to be honest and candid about the intractability of the difficulties, honest and candid about the deep, deep uh, see the nature of systemic racism and white supremacy, but ultimately we have to give people hope and we have to speak to their moral aspirations, not merely the economic conditions, not merely the policy prescriptions. You got to move people, you got to inspire people because at the end of the day, people risk their lives. So, in, case in point, in Minneapolis, after Jamar Clark was killed, I remember flying into Minneapolis, 20 degree weather, meeting young people on the street outside of a police precinct with bonfires burning 10 feet into the air. 24 hours after I left, two white nationalists shot five people on that same street corner. The lesson here, those young people didn't move. Those young people didn't give up. They did not give in. They did not give over. They were, in fact, inspired in a resilient way by a sense of hope about the possibilities about what might be done. Last point, organizationally, my colleagues have spoken to this. Because of digital technology, being diffuse and democratic, our forms of governance cannot be undemocratic uh, and not diffuse. So in other words, old schoolers can't govern, can't lead in the ways that have been done 50 years ago. In other words, we have to op bring, open up the table. We have to bring in new voices, bring in new colleagues, build out coalitions. And to Dr. Tatum's point, demographically, our coalitions have to be broader. They have to be broader racially and ethno ethnically, religiously, non-religiously. And we have to understand the fact that millennials don't people as in joining to get active. They get active to think about joining. Which means that you got to get people engaged and involved and talk about membership later. I want to ask a question of um, the historian and, and also building on what was just said, what Cornell just said, and that has to do with an article I read after the Trump election, after the, after the November election, I read an op-ed that said, in the title of it was in the Washington Post, the title of it was, in the age of Trump, what would the abolitionists do? And it was a really interesting op-ed, and the author talked about the fact that, you know, back in the 19th century, there was a time when the abolitionists were working toward the abolition of slavery, and they had a legislative setback, and in and they responded by mobilizing in the way that they would have done had they had Twitter, but they didn't. They were using the penny press and leafleting their neighbors and friends. And it was a really kind of door-to-door, -door, person to person campaign to help their friends and neighbors understand the urgency of the issue that they were focused on. And what struck me about that when I read it was it seemed to me that we were in the, you know, someone referenced earlier today the second reconstruction, the end of the second reconstruction, um, that we might be in that moment where you have to mobilize person to person, door to door. Um, of course, you can do that on Twitter um, in the way that we've talked about, and I am a Twitter user. At the same time, I come back to my point about face to face dialogue, that it seems to me there's a lot of, there's growing grassroots dialogue happening in communities, whether it's, you know, be the bridge.com or study circles or uh, intergroup dialogue that's being required in some colleges and universities, but that even, you know, I'm thinking about the response to 
the move, March for Our Lives, right? So we have this gun violence and we have those Parkland youth uh, organizing and that big march. And for a lot of people, they responded positively to that march because the, I'm thinking now about white people's responses to that march because they think that could have been my son, my daughter in that high school. You know, those are my kids on the stage. Um, as compared to the mobilization of black youth in the Black Lives Matter effort in which the response is call out the National Guard, right? right? right. Contain them. Right. Um, and that's all about empathy or lack thereof. Right. Right. And so it's, which brings me back to my point, which is to say that if we have to figure out a way, maybe like those abolitionists did back in the 19th century, to engage on a door to door, person to person basis to build that moral urge, a uh, moral sense of um, build a bigger tent. This is not just about those people, this is about my people, yeah. right? Yeah. Broadening the definition of who my people are. I heard a story once. Um, a friend of mine who's an activist and organizer in California told a story about um, Cesar Chavez. So at three o'clock in the morning, Chavez gets a knock on his door and it's these two, these two young activists who said, you know, Sorry to bother you, you know it's crazy early in the morning. Um, you're a legendary organizer and we wanna know your secret to organizing. And he says, sure, come on and have a seat. Gives him something to drink. And uh, they're like, what's your secret? He says, well, first you go knock on a door. And then you knock on another door. They're like, no, 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 wait, no, no. What's your secret <laughs> to organize? And he says, oh, oh, my secret. My bad, I got you. First, you knock on a door. <laughs> and then you knock on another door. Right? And so I think it's really important for us to, to, to understand and make the distinction between um, the electronic organizing, if you could even call it that, that I think that happens, right? which I think is also um, massive. Right? That's, that's how you get media attention now. Right? Um, we've got to make a distinction between that and the intimate levels of organizing that happens in cities. Right? You know, organizers here in Memphis um, are um, are doing that work on the ground in terms of slowly but surely building that circle of trust, as SNCC would call it, right? Mm -hmm. Slowly but surely building that, um, that, that, that brotherhood, that sisterhood, right? That, that, that beloved community of individuals in, um, deeply concerned with a host of issues, right? And so we saw that playing out um, during the statue removal stuff here in Memphis when we got these statues down of our um, favorite slave trading racial terrorists. Um, and um, when you would go to one of these mobilizations, um, Kedron Franklin of Coalition for Concerned Citizens and, and Tammy Sawyer for Take Them Down 901, they would always sort of give honor and thanks to all of the organizations represented in that moment, right? And it was always a list of six, seven, eight, nine, ten organizations, right? Of, organiza of folks who are mobilized around particular other issues who've come together for this issue. What does that mean? It means that there are six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty other organizations out in town that people have built, again, door to door, right? Folks in Binghampton are building organizations. Folks in Orange Mound are building organizations. Folks in Smoky, Smoky City are building organizations, right, on the ground. And so that's the, as Ella Baker, the, the, the famous civil rights activist, Ella Baker, used to say, that's the slow, respectful work of organizing. Right? That's the nucleus, that's the core right, of, of, of organizing work. And so we tend to, we, we, it's very easy for us to sort of get lost in the, 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 the bright lights and the, shiny, you know, the shininess of, of Twitter and Instagram and all this other kind of stuff. That has its place. But at the end of the day, in a town like Memphis, right, in a town like Ferguson, in a town like Los Angeles, in a town like any town, right, at the end of the day, the Chavez model applies in terms of knocking on doors and slowly building your band of, 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 of humans who are dedicated to doing, to doing this work and trying to figure out how to get this work done on a local level. I, I'd love to jump on that and add something to it because I, I, and I, I think there's an important issue here, this, this sort of persistent commitment to, yes. to change and to uh, improving the quality of our communities. This was a reach of King that I think is almost distinctive to his leadership, is that in addition to making the case about social injustice, he made the reach to what it takes to have a beloved community, to actually bring everybody, enemies 
together and live in a community uh, together, what, what it would, would take. So I, I, I always look back and you, you look among the many spokespeople of that era and he stands out in that, in that regard, uh, uh, as does that, maybe that whole era of, of his leadership. Uh, and one, one uh, point which I think connects to, to your point, I, I, I see this in universities, maybe I can use that as a, as a, a good um, model for what I'm talking about, but often universities don't do much and then something bad happens and then they try to hurry up and do a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, cities are probably a bit like that. Uh, something horrible happens and then by God everybody is 5,000 committees proliferate, uh, all, uh, all of which are kind of marginally trusted and almost, almost make people lose a little faith in the whole enterprise of improving the quality of, of communities. Uh, whereas uh, if, if there's a more, more of a prevention, consistent focus of the sort that you're talking about, an ongoing effort where people are involved before uh, uh, some major outbreak uh, 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 happens, uh, then, then a, community, a, a community really has trust in place that can make a difference when, when, some, when things do go wrong or they can, they can, and that has the best chance of making an overall difference uh, anyway. And I, I think that strategic point of focusing as much on prevention as we do on, on reaction is an important part of where activism should go. Yeah, yeah. You made so, a, oh, go ahead. Sure. So uh, thinking about your question in terms of um, not so much the abolitionists, but the folks who led the anti-lynching campaign in the wake of the first reconstruction and prior to the second reconstruction, uh, in the 1960s. So if we think about Ida B. Wells, right, uh, this uh, powerful African-American woman of Victorian sensibilities who when she was pulled off of a segregated train, she planted her teeth in the hands of the conductor, um, which <laughs> spoke and to, yeah, and sued, and sued. But, but she's a model I think is very helpful for this present movement in the sense that she was about both creating le new legal standards and changing the narrative, as well as bringing people together. So changing legal standards, in other words, when the police would give over a lynch victim to the lynch mob, uh, Ida B. Wells was about trying to figure out ways to hold the police accountable. Take, second, changing the narrative. So in other words, in a day when black people were seen as the criminalized other. She made it her business to criminalize the people, people engaging in state-sanctioned violence. Today's activists are doing that. Uh, thirdly, bringing people together in an organized and sustained way to bring about social change. I think uh, Claude's earlier point about the distinctiveness of Dr. King is a point that really bears underscoring here. So in other words, Dr. King wasn't merely about the pragmatic means. He was also about the eschatological vision at the end. So in other words, we don't need, merely need to crawl through purgatory and hell and earth. We need to be talking about heaven and the kingdom of God and what justice looks like fully realized. That's what inspires people. That's what keeps people going day to day. When we just focus on the, like, the policy specifics of this place or that place in a disconnected way, but when you realize that Ferguson is collected, connected to Flint, Flint to Chicago, Chicago to Miami, Miami to New York, and you give the people a vision that, that brings them together, right? And you hold them together, giving them new, new policy strategies, new legal means, changing the narrative, creating an infrastructure, if you will, of organization and listening. Right? So in other words, creating groups and organizations that create a feedback so that people feel heard, you make progress, sustainably speaking. I wanted to, I wanted to jump in really quick too about this, this other point about hope. I think that King is so instructive here when it comes to how do we navigate, how do we think about, how do we think about hope. And there's two types of hope, right? One is the, the, the cheap hope, right? Um, I was given a talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was not a happy talk. Um, it was about um, this, right? And at the end of the talk, someone came up to me and said, well, give me something to, to hope. Give me, make me feel hopeful, right? Give me something to hope. You know what? Make me feel hopeful. 
you know, like hope is dispensed like a, like a Pez dispenser, right? You know, just, you know, just pop out some, pop out some hope. Um, and that's not what King's talking about, right? And I, I've been grappling with this ever since that, that moment that, that that thing happened, right? Mm. And I came up with this, I had this epiphany and it's rooted in King, right? The hope is to be found in the work, right? That's where we find the hope. Um, it's not to be found on my couch. Mm. It's not to be found in the assumption that other people are going to do this work, right? The hope is found in the work itself. That's why King could be hopeful because his hope was intimately tied to, right, struggle. His hope was intimately tied to activism. He was not going to DC on the poor people's campaign to simply sing some Negro spirituals. Mm -hmm. He wanted to mobilize tens of thousands of poor and working class people, yellow, red, and black, and white, everybody, to come to, to, come to Washington, DC, and park on the lawn until the federal government started to address the issue of poverty, right? So his hopefulness, right, which was a guarded hopefulness, right, is very much rooted in the work that he was doing. It's very much rooted in the, in the work of social change, right? And, and it's that work also, again, that activists, going back to, going back to the Birmingham example, right, it's that work, the work of activists that seeks to create those spaces so that we can have conversations about the sorts of things that need to happen, right? So what's gonna happen after we bring 50,000 poor and working class people to Washington, D.C.? Do we have your attention now, Mr. Uh, Mr. President? Do we have your attention, Senate and, and, and House? Now, let's have a conversation about something that you were less and less prone to wanna have a conversation about because of the Vietnam War, because of shifting political and economic interests, right? And so, and so again, I think there's this, there's this really, you know, King is great at this, at crafting this nexus, right? Of, of hope, of work, of struggle, of, 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 of optimism, right? At the end of chaos or community, right? He doesn't choose chaos. He was like, look, we have to avoid this. And we know what we need to do in order to, to avoid this, right? And he talks about that long, but beautiful struggle for the creation of a new world. And it's that struggle that King is intimately engaged in, um, again, thinking about nexus, right? King is thinking about these three, these three modes, love, justice, and power. What we have done with King in 2018 is lopped off power and justice, and we just talk about love. <laughs> Right? We just sort of talk about, we just sort of talk about, you know, King wanted, you know, and, you know, King loved everybody and he wanted everybody to love everybody. Sit down. That's not right. Right? That's, no, that's the candy, you know, no. There's a nexus here. There's a relationship here between love and justice and power. That's what made King hopeful was that once we get the, once we get the equation right, right, once we get the equation right in terms of interacting with the federal government, in terms of interacting with governors, in terms of interacting with, with cities and municipalities, with corporations, with companies. Once we get these, once we get those, once we get those levels straight, then we can move forward. But again, you can't do that devoid of any one of those three, any one of those three components, right? He's got this quote, and I'll pull it up in a minute, about you know, love without justice and power is just sentimentality, right? It's just cotton candy. Right? Power without love is abusive. It's abusive, and we've seen that. We're living that now. Right? So we have to have these, we have to have, we've got to get the levels right when it comes to love and justice and power if we seek to move forward. So let me just interject real quick. I hate to, I hate to do so. Um, in a few minutes, uh, we will sort of open up to the audience for questions. So if you've got a question sort of brewing, then maybe start making your way towards the microphones. Uh, I'd like to just uh, put another sort of thought out there. Uh, Terry Freeman mentioned this morning the, the quote from Dr. King about the duty to disobey unjust laws. And the talk throughout the day has been about um, structures in place that are um, holding back change that are, that are uh, causing the inequities that have been discussed throughout the day. And so I guess my question is, in part, if we're operating within uh, 
a situation that has not only unjust laws, but unjust customs, unjust um, culture, un unjust you name it. Um, what are the ways in which activists engage within that system? If the system is structurally flawed um, or there are structural flaws, what are the levers activists um, can target in a system that is set up against their success? Mm -hmm. I have a thought about that. I don't know if it's, um, you know, I don't know if it directly answers your question, but one of the things I've been thinking about, I was thinking about it just now as uh, Charles was speaking about Dr. King, was his use of history. You know, I saw recently, just last night actually, I saw a little video clip of him speaking about the ways in which um, white people were given assistance to build wealth, whether that was, we heard earlier today the example of the way the VH, the, you know, the veterans got access to low interest loans, those VA loans, which went disproportionately to white vets and not to black veterans because of, for lots of reasons, but we could talk about the way residential segregation you know, prevented access to those material, you know, to those resources. And so he was talking about, you know, the access to um, free land, you know, when the U.S. was expanding west, you know, white settlers got free land. Mm -hmm. And then they got, you know, um, land grant institutions to educate them. And then they got farmer subsidies and, yep. you know, all the yep. things that white people got GI that bills. GI bills, exactly, that right. gave them an opportunity to move from, you know, poor immigrants to thriving middle class to even uh, wealthy people and that that lack of knowledge or history, you know, the sort of uh, convenient uh, forgetting about those programs then allows those people to turn to black people and say, well, you know, why aren't you working harder? You know, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps um, kind of response. And so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about relative to dialogue is the importance of bringing history into that. You know, I taught a course on the psychology of racism for many years, and it was always quite striking to me how little historical knowledge my students had. You know, so that, for example, just talking about the GI Bill and its differential um, distribution of those benefits, you know, that that's part of my family story. My father was a veteran, and you know, when I was born in 1954, he couldn't go to. I was born in Tallahassee, Florida. My father was a college professor teaching at Florida A&M with a master's degree, wanted a doctorate, and wanted to go to Florida State. But in 1954, Florida State, which is also in Tallahassee, is still segregated. Um, I was born post-Brown. Brown decision was in May. I was born in September. But my father's uh, problem wasn't solved by Brown. Um, but the state of Florida chose to solve its legal problem by sending him, paying his transportation, mm -hmm. not his tuition, he would always remind me, but paying his transportation to Pennsylvania. So he commuted to Pennsylvania, got his degree at Penn State. When I tell that story to young audiences, they're like, what? You know, it's like news to them, but it was a very common experience. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I think is our, part of the, the challenge we have I'm not old today, enough to know anything about that, but I <laughs> <laughs> Part of the challenge we have today is that, you know, we don't know that history. I mean, you know, Things that happened in my lifetime are, not, if, you were, if you are 20 years old today, you were born in 1998, mm. right? You, you know, Oof. you don't know Ouch. that. It, Ouch, <laughs> you could have you kept saying. that, Beverly, you could have kept that. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, and. It's getting and, hot in here. <laughs> and it's not just the 20 year olds, it's the 40 year olds. You know what I mean? That there's a lot of missing information. And so people look at, Black Lives Matter, and they like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, right? Because they don't have, the, unless they read the Ferguson report, they don't know about that predatory practice. And, and that's part of the challenge, that we have to share stories that people don't want to hear, and that history, you can't reconcile the present without coming to terms with the past. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, just thinking about um, 
this challenge of how do we share our history and, and how do we educate ourselves about the possibilities in the present with respect to the future, mindful of the past. Yeah. Part of it is, I think part of the challenge is the, the moral urge to respond to injustice must be connected with the need to know, need to learn, yeah. right? And so one of the things that, that I tried to do um, at the NAACP, when we marched from Selma to Washington, we understood that that was going to take 43 days. It was 1,002 miles. But if you just marched, that was essentially a long walk, right? Uh, and, and not in the Nelson Mandela sense of the word. <clears throat> but if you connected old, as I say, new school technology to old school practice, you know, the Highlander Folk School, uh, citizenship schools, having Weekly, as to have, having teach-ins online and in person on a nightly basis, resurrecting the history. So for example, helping young brothers understand that the foundation of the modern civil rights movement was laid down by, by Rosa Parks and Recy Taylor 10 years before the Montgomery boycott. That didn't happen when Oprah lifted this up on national television, right? Like, but that only gets out if we connect the activism and the education, when we bring the 12-year-olds and sit them next to the 50-year-olds and the 60-year-olds as equals, that's only where that happens. And I think we, are, we have this extraordinary moment of opportunity right now where we have generationally unprecedented activism and generationally unprecedented interest in this history. Like, for example, this week is really a, for, a phenomenal teach-in moment for the entire country. And so to the extent that we put it on social media, to the extent we talk about it, we engage it, we tease it. In, in, in some ways, this is like um, uh, in church, you use the Sunday morning sermon to tantalize and tease the people to get them into the Wednesday night Bible study. That's where the real learning happens. Mm -hmm. But you only got 20 minutes on Sunday, right? You got an hour and a half on Wednesday night. This is like our 20 minute moment, mm -hmm. right? But I, th I think that this is that kind of occasion where if we connect the education to the activism, activism and really create structure for it. Because you know, I think part of the challenge is we have these tweetable moments, they're evanescent, they're here today, gone tomorrow, as opposed to really putting people in a room on a sustained basis and, it, and connecting the education, the, the uh, civic engagement, the mobilization, the voting, right? Uh, you know, it, you know when, when you think about the fact that with the election and re-election of President Obama, young people and black women led the country and voted. Only a few years later, mm -hmm. the young people did not turn out in the same way, though they led the country again in activism. Mm -hmm. So now we have this moment here in Memphis, and I, th I think it's uh, one to be seized, not squandered. So, I don't, see, I don't see anybody at the microphone, so I'm just gonna ask. <laughs> for someone to come up to the microphone. <laughs> Hi, this uh, question is kind of tied to this conversation and the first one uh, today. Uh, thinking about t technology and the impact of discrimination, talk a little bit about, uh, just say for instance in Memphis, uh, Memphis Police Department uses Blue Crush and we talked about implicit bias and how that affects like who you, you give traffic tickets to and all the po points of the criminal justice sim uh, system. Speak a little bit more about why we need to be vigilant in how technology is being used and artificial, artificial intelligence being used and how our communities are being policed. Absolutely. So one of the things that I, I think is, this is probably, um, probably one of the most uh, important questions to be lifted up now. So when we think about cities like uh, Chicago, where we use uh, algorithms to predict not only who's going to be killed, but who supposedly will do the killing. And we use these algorithms to send police to determine which neighborhoods should be policed the most, and embedded in the math are certain assumptions about who should be preyed upon, who should be protected, uh, who's deserving of policing out of existence. And part of our challenge is many of our folk are intimidated by the technology, intimi intimidated by the pseudo-sophistication of this map. 
We pay for these contractors. We pay for big data. We pay for the police. And it's up to them to explain to us what they're doing in our neighborhoods and not the other way around. And so this is a moment where, in the same way that we've seen in the context of banking, right, where we, we see uh, uh, very sophisticated models to predict where you should lend and where you shouldn't lend, and that just happens to coincide in terms of where black and brown people live. And again, we have to hold people accountable in terms of explaining the math, explaining um, you know, the, the quantitative nature of this in moral terms. And so I, I think a big part of this is demystifying, two, creating community a accountability, three, not opening the door, not having this be a binary decision. In other words, you bring in these firms, you bring in this data, um, and then at some distant point in the future, you assess it. You know, on an ongoing basis, we need to make these people accountable. One of the things that um, I'm constantly reminding my students of is when we talk about stuff like artificial intelligence, um, that's, that's about big data as well, right? And, and so, for instance, um, a number of years ago, I think this was in the, during, the, during the election, run up to the uh, 2016 election, um, uh, I think it was Stanford, I'm not sure if it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was Stanford, some other, some other institution maybe, um, was running, was running, uh, um, was running uh, an experiment on their artificial, you know, being HAL or whatever, right? And, um, and so they started asking, asking this AI certain questions about certain topics, right? Um, and one of the questions it asked, was asked was, you know, give me what you think about Mexicans. Right? Now, how does big data work? Right? This, this, this artificial intelligence is drawing on all corners of the internet right, to come up with a conclusion about this question, about this query that has been generated. Mm -hmm. right? So when you ask this artificial intelligence about Mexicans, quote unquote Mexicans, it came back spewing some of the most vile and racist material and information that, because, because the internet, That's right? And so, so we have to, and I'm thinking about the last panel too, we have to think about the ways in which race affects, with an A, affects so many of, all of our sectors, right? Uh, white supremacy is the water, we are the fish. Um, AI is not exempted from that, right? You know, big data is not exempted from that. So Blue Crush um, and all of these other, you know, and all of these other sorts of mechanisms are designed, are, are ultimately rooted in, right, a really problematic slash racist rendering of, of American society, right? The, the algorithms being used um, in, in terms of, you know, how we should interact with, how the cops should interact with poor and working class black communities it's going to look a little different from how um, how cops should interact with um, white middle class or white working class communities, even though those communities, um, the drug usage rates are just as high in those communities as they are in the black communities, yeah. right? Those algorithms in city after city after city look really, really different. Why is that? We know why. Again, so again, that you, this is a great point. We've got to really be vigilant when it comes to how this how, how this technology is being used. Yes, uh, Dr. Kang was a man of faith, and the faith community was in front of the civil rights movement. Dr. Kang was also an activist. I want to congratulate those who put this program together. We've had great speakers, great panelists, but one of the things I've noted is that there's not a voice from the faith community. And I'm wondering, <clears throat> what does that mean? And how did that happen? And what's the significance of that in today's society? Dr. Kang was able to speak as a man of faith, but also <clears throat> he was able to integrate his faith with the Constitution and social activism, and so forth. Uh, the, what's missing, again, is the voice from the faith community at this conference, uh, and what does that mean in terms of uh, where we were working together and where we are now? Sure. So what role for the faith community? 
So, you know, let me at least, uh, in a moment of self-disclosure, um, reveal I'm a fourth-generation minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. But you raise a larger question and a more important question uh, in terms of where's the faith community relative to the present struggle. I think in many ways the faith community is not given the credit that it deserves. So if you travel the country with respect to criminal justice reform, uh, the fiscal conservatives are out front on this, but the faith community is far more out front on bail reform, on uh, juvenile justice reform, on ban the box, prison reentry, uh, on voting rights. The faith community is way out front. And I'm, I'm not talking about way out front just in terms of being prominent at the mic, but making real sacrifices. For example, when we did that march from Selma to DC, one out of every 10 reform rabbis in the country marched. Plenty of Baptists, plenty of Episcopalians. No cameras, no CNN, no MSNBC, people doing the work. You travel the, around the country, you see these marches and demonstrations, folks wearing clergy collars, some folks wearing jeans, but all of everybody wearing uh, their tradition uh, and their faith tradition. So part of the issue is sometimes what's not seen as prominent in the news is seen as not prominent in the struggle. My sense is the faith community is way out front on this. We need to give them far more credit. Now that being said, some of my colleagues uh, are one issue clergy people, right? So we, 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 we put an importance, a significant, say, say for example, on abortion. I'm not taking a position against it or for it, but I'm simply saying there are people who put a lot of moral primacy on this issue to the exclusion of gun violence, to the silence with respect to black lives being demattered, uh, who ignore uh, voting rights violations in their own backyards. Now for those folk, if we're honest and true to our respective faith traditions, we have to keep, we have to hold ourselves accountable, we have to be morally humble, but we also have to hold them accountable. Because you can't preach one thing on Sunday, uh, or Saturday, or Friday, and ignore what happens the rest of the week. So I would just add to the amen, first off. Amen. <laughs> amen. Um, also, in a spirit of full disclosure, my, um, my grandfather, George Dallas McKinney, helped Charles H. Mason spread um, the denomination Church of God in Christ. Um, my uncle's a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Hi, hey, Uncle George. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, again, full disclosure. Wyatt T. Walker, who was the chief of staff for the Southern Christian Leadership right. Conference, told me something once that I will never forget. And it was this, 1963, Birmingham. What percentage of churches Black churches, do you think were actively involved in the Birmingham movement? I'll give you the answer. Mm -hmm. It was not 70, it was not 50, it wasn't 30, it wasn't 20, it was 9% yeah. of black churches in Birmingham actively engaged in the Birmingham movement, 9%. Go to Birmingham now, every black preacher over the age of 80 marched with Martin. <laughs> Right? True. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in the clergy, so I can call people out. So I'm, I'm good, right? You know, it, it, it is well with my soul, right? So, so, um, so, what I think, so what I think happens, right? Let him use me. Let him use me. So what I think, what I think we have to do, what I think we have to be mindful of. You do that right, rather is, well now. Hey, I'm just saying. What we, have to, what we have to be mindful of is, yes, the clergy has played a role but uh, as a historian, I'm interested in understanding what kind of role the clergy actually play <laughs> and who in the religious community actually played that role. When you go to rural Mississippi, it wasn't the preachers who were out front in the movement. It was the black women in the church who were out front in the movement. Right? And what they did, like Fannie Lou Hamer and other folks, is they wound up having to drag their, their pastors into the movement because the folks in the church, the deacons and the men and the women, particularly the women who were in the vanguard of this movement, in the vanguard of this movement, in the vanguard of this movement, have to drag male leadership into the movement. So Reverend Neckbone didn't want nothing to do with this movement until Fannie Lou Hammer came along and shamed him into activity. <laughs> 50 years later, Reverend Neckbone is known as, a, as, as somebody who marched with Martin and who was down for the struggle. But back in 1962, back in 1963, he didn't want nothing to do with this struggle. Let's be real. 
right? So, so that's the other thing that we have to balance here in terms of, yes the, faith, yes, the religious community, yes, the faith community was involved. Who in that church was involved? And in what ways were they involved? So we also have to be really, um, we, have to, we, have to, we have to think about that. Also, we gotta, come, we gotta come to grips with the fact that we got a significant portion of our church community now, particularly these black churches, right, that have drunk this, you know, that, that, are, that are drinking prosperity. the gospel of prosperity gospel. Yeah. Right, that drunk, you know, that drunk, that that putrid, that putrid, a holy, un unholy water, right? That are running around um, with consigned poor and working class people to hell because because simply because they're not middle class, right? All of the maladies that we talked about in that previous panel, we can assign that also to prosperity preaching. They say, well, you know what? Hey, you know what? If you're poor, maybe you're just not Christian enough, right? That ain't in the Bible. Right? Martin King would be ashamed of some of these people running around calling themselves faith leaders now who don't have the moral courage to stand up and say, like King did, that poverty is a moral issue. People are made poor in this society. Why are we making them poor? We have to do that. And if we want to do that, that means sometimes we have to speak truth to power. Right? So that 9% in Birmingham back in 63, they knew the risks that they were taking. And they understood that they were speaking truth to power. They also understood that their churches may be bombed. They also understood they may lose their lives. They got that. They understood that. So, so for me, the question isn't necessarily who's, in, you know, who's involved, how are you involved? And what are you willing to do? What are you willing to risk? Right, to build this new world that we say we want. And if you want to be a leader, and if you want to get tagged as a leader, I need you to, I need to me personally, I need to see you out in the street with us. You know, so, because well, that's where we'll be. You know, I, I would, I, 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 I just, add one, one thought to that? I, I, one thought, I, I, there, we have one person that's, that's there, okay. and we're already running over. The risk I'm going to take is that we're going to go a little long, and I think that we're going to, we're going to roll with it. Okay. Um, so one thought, one okay. question, quick answers. Well, I, I, I heartily agree with all you just said. I wish I, I, I enjoyed vicariously your exper the experience of you saying all that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I grew up in Chicago. I remember when Martin Luther King went through the door of one of the major African-American churches there mm -hmm. on Sunday. The next, that Monday, they bricked in that door. Yeah. So he was not a popular man in, right. in, in the African-American church establishment right. at that time. But uh, one thing I think in uh, honor of the question was asked that, that I think we miss from King's version of Christianity was its redemptive capacity mm -hmm. and its, uh, its commitment to nonviolence as part of that. Uh, there, there, there was something in that that was galvanizing of a lot of people and uh, en enable people to see things that I think uh, w without that being a prominent part of our ethos at this, at this time, we, we miss, we're missing a gear that, uh, that he had and I think he derived, I'm a social scientist so I'm, I can't speak like you uh, gentlemen as, with any credibility about being a man of faith, uh, but, but I can see uh, from the sort of social, psychological uh, uh, point of view, the value of that capacity uh, of, of offering redemption, a road to redemption, mm -hmm. face saving, nonviolence. I mean, there are components of his strategy that I think he derived from his version of, of, of Christianity that were powerful parts of the, of the movement and that were big parts of, of its success. Yeah. I know well, you're trying to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> But I just feel uh, important to say, because we've heard a lot about uh, black church leaders, and I want to say something about the importance of white church leaders to step up to the plate. And I um, am thinking about Jim Wallace's book, America's Original Sin, which, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Jim Wallace, is a white yeah. minister who's the publisher of Sojourner's Magazine. But I am remembering an experience I had. I used to do unlearning racism workshops with a white co-facilitator, and we were in St. Louis in the early 90s doing a retreat, a two-day retreat with clergy. It was very multiracial, multi-faith, uh, all different denominations, including Muslims, Jews, Christians, uh, a group of maybe 30, 40 clergy, and in this overnight retreat focused on unlearning racism. And one of the things that was so striking to me was the fear 
that white clergy had about talking about racism from the pulpit. And I remember mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. being quite struck by that because it seemed to me that if you truly were the faith leader, that you would, your faith would overcome your fear, right? That you would be able, <laughs> naively, I thought that, um, and that, you know, that you would be able to speak about this issue in a way that, because people said, you know, I know I should be speaking about it, but I'm not, I'm afraid they'll run me out of my pulpit. I mean, this was the kind of thing that people were talking about. Mm -hmm. And in the spirit of full disclosure, um, after that experience, I went to seminary. <laughs> um, I, I got a degree, a master's degree from Hartford oh. Seminary, in part because I wanted to be able to talk to clergy in their own language mm -hmm. um, about why they needed to be speaking out about racism. Wow. But having said that, so I'm I think the only non-religious person on this panel. Perhaps. <laughs> um, we'll pray for, for you. Now. We'll pray for, for you now. now. <laughs> you never we got, know we got you. what could happen. We got you. So, my, my, and I was the one defending it. Right? <laughs> but, but my I point think, here is that I know you want to hear the question yes. is simply that, you know, I think, again, we have to acknowledge the history, the way that religion has been used in an oppressive way mm -hmm. to maintain mm -hmm. uh, racism and white supremacy in our society, particularly within white communities, but also the opportunity, you used the word, or maybe it was you, uh, the possibility of redemption. Um, and certainly we see more and more, I see this in Atlanta and in other parts around the country, more and more uh, white faith leaders stepping up to the plate, wanting to both acknowledge the wrong of the past and to set on a new course in much the spirit of Jim Wallace and his book. So I promised you you would have your question. I won't allow that oppression of time to rob you of that. I'll make it quick. Yes. Mine's is more of a comment, and it does deal with the question of, of dealing with ministers. Um, I can't speak to what happened before 1968 at the sanitation strike, but I can say that the ministers here in Memphis and the churches here in Memphis were very involved in the sanitation strike. After Dr. King, the CME, uh, Reverend Lawson was the reason that Dr. King, one of the reasons Dr. King was invited him, because he was uh, uh, SCLC, Reverend Montgomery was also very involved. And after Dr. King was killed, this is at In the River I Stand, there's a book. Mm -hmm. uh, after Dr. King was killed, uh, ministers of all faith, all denominations, Greek Orthodox, Rabbi, ra right. Rabbi Wax, they all met at St. Mary's Episcopal Church and prayed. And then they all walked two by two from St. Mary's up Poplar Avenue to City Hall and demanded that Mayor Lowe be in the strike, which he didn't. But it was in response to his comment uh, in recognition of the minister's con contribution to that, uh, what they did for the sanitation workers, there is an MLK uh, sanction uh, commemoration of that event on Saturday, April the 7th. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank you so much. And what a beautiful image of activism making its way down the road uh, to City Hall. So th thank you uh, for that image to close with. And I just want to say thank you to you guys. Uh, what a terrific panel and all the panelists throughout the day. Thank you, brother. Thank you for your words. Yeah, no, thank you. In closing, when we started this program this morning, I told you we were going to have a, an exceptional group of panelists to share with you their perspectives, and I think all of our panels more than exceeded that, that, that standard, so I'd like to thank all of our presenters for one last time. As I mentioned also earlier this morning, um, each of our panelists will be publishing an essay later this year in a special, a special issue of the University of Memphis Law Review. That issue is going to provide a lasting written record of today's symposium and will provide a blueprint for the future, so we'll be sure to let you know when that is available. So let me conclude by again offering my heartfelt thanks to our moderators and panel, panelists. Uh, thanks again to all of our sponsors. And again, th thanks to the tr tremendous, for the tremendous support of the staffs at the University of Memphis at the National Civil Rights Museum and at the Peabody Hotel for being such wonderful hosts today and taking such good care of us. So have a pleasant evening, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>